All right, it looks like we have a critical mass. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and happy Baltimore Innovation Week. Uh, thank you for joining us for Finding the 95%, How Going Global Can Accelerate Your Startup. My name is Andrew Glass, and I'm a commercial officer with the U.S. Commercial Service in Baltimore. We are part of the International Trade Administration within the Department of Commerce. And our mission is simple. We help U.S. companies to increase their international sales and to level the playing field for U.S. companies abroad. So we have a great program planned for you today with expert panelists. Uh, we'll have three panels today. We'll begin with My Global Startup Story, in which you'll hear from early stage businesses that have successfully gone global. Then we will hear about three ingredients for going global. So during this panel, we'll learn about finding the right markets for your product and services, protecting your IP, and implementing the all important digital sales strategy. And finally, we'll bring what we've learned to life with concrete next steps and resources to help you succeed at the federal, state, and local levels in our final panel. So be sure to stick around for that panel as we'll be chatting specific next steps for your business. So on a logistical note, we'll run till about 1.45 today. Please be sure to mute your mics uh, when you're not speaking so we can all hear. Uh, and absolutely make use of the chat function for any questions that you may have as we go through uh, the panels today. And of course, we'll be sure to follow up in a note with all of the resources that we presented today. And now I'd like to introduce three very important people uh, without whom this event would not be possible. First, Jake Colvin and Jamaica Gale, representing the Global Innovation Forum, are our partners for this event. The Global Innovation Forum is a nonprofit startup that connects entrepreneur, small business, corporate, development, and university communities with policymakers to explore the opportunities and challenges of engaging in the global marketplace. Jamaica is Deputy Director of the Global Innovation Forum and will be moderating our first panel, My Global Startup Story. And Jake is Executive Director and will be moder moderating our second panel, Three Ingredients for Going Global. And finally, my colleague, Tricia Van Orden, who serves as Deputy Director of the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee Secretariat within the Department of Commerce, will moderate our final panel on resources to help you go global. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jamaica Gale to kick off our first panel. Jamaica? Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we are delighted to be co-hosting this conversation today. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, my name is Jamaica Gale. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Innovation Forum. Um, so at GIF, our goal is to connect entrepreneurs and startups with the resources that they need to succeed in the global marketplace. So we emphasize how global engagement and the use of digital tools can help improve the resiliency of small businesses and the role of public policy um, in enabling that success. So the purpose of today's discussion, as Andrew touched on, um, it aligns with a lot of work that the Global Innovation Forum does. Um, so to provide focused advice to small businesses um, with an emphasis on Baltimore today um, that are interested in growing their businesses globally and unlocking that 95%. Um, so with that said, um, we are ready to do exactly that and jump into our first panel. Um, so I'm gonna ask my first panel to join me on camera. Um, so I am grateful to be joined by two Baltimore-based startups, Global Air Media and Sonavi Labs. Um, so they've both successfully gone global. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction, and then I'll let the startups speak for themselves. But with us today, we have Andrew Brown. He is the co-founder of Global Air Media, a drone training, mapping, and engineering company. He is also the co-founder of a nonprofit drone education and training organization. And then from Sovani Labs, we have Ellington West, the CEO and co-founder, as well as Brandon Dottenhaley, the Chief Business Development Officer. Um, so Sovani Labs is a medical device and software company that develops advanced telehealth uh, technologies. Um, so with that said, I think we can jump right in. Um, Ellington and Brandon, I'm going to turn to you first. If you would just like to give us a brief introduction and share a little bit more about what you do, your business, and then the role of global market. Hi, good morning um, or afternoon. Uh, we're excited to be able to participate in this panel. And again, uh, thank you so much to uh, Commercial Service Jamaica and Andrew for everything that you've done uh, to support Sanavi Labs and the work that we're doing. Um, we were excited to participate in the export tech program earlier this year, and um, it's been 
very helpful to us. Um, so at Sanavi Labs, we are creating medical devices and software, and we are working to deploy um, diagnostic tools that can ultimately save lives um, all over the world. Um, we have trained uh, Felix, which is a digital stethoscope. Uh, it fits in the palm of your hand, you hold it up to your chest, and it's designed to detect pneumonia in about 10 to 15 seconds with the same accuracy as a, um, for, as a physician. And so um, our goal is to save lives. And this project started about seven years ago at Johns Hopkins um, in Dr. James West's lab. He's a world-renowned inventor and acoustician who actually invented the electric microphone um, that is making this conversation possible. Um, and so the work that he um, found, started with our other uh, co-founder Ian McLean um, has really laid the foundation for what Ellington and I are working to deploy now all over the world to not only impact patients um, who are um, you know, impacted by uh, acute conditions like pneumonia and even tuberculosis, but also asthma and COPD. Um, so yeah, yeah that's kind that's of what we're awesome. doing. We started global, but we realized that for um, our investors and a lot of the focus that we needed on the front end, we needed a strong North American reimbursement strategy. And then we were able to layer in really that global growth that we wanted through the support that we had through Export Tech. So it's really, it's been a wonderful journey for us as we continue to go grow globally. We're in about 10 countries right now. Um, and that is really hinging on a lot of our research partners. Um, um, and that's been really our, our initial pathway in. But then after our program and the support that we, we've received, we now have, I think, a very strategic um, strategy in line for our global expansion. Incredible. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, Austin, I'm going to turn to you uh, with the same first question. If you can just start off by telling us a little bit um, about who you are, what you do, and the role of uh, global markets and just how you're engaging globally. Thank you, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the commercial service and, and Jamaica for having us as well. Um, we've been working with commercial service for about three years now, a uh, Baltimore-based company, and we're in the drone industry. Um, can you all hear me okay? Just make sure. you good? I think you might be breaking out a little bit. Can you hear me? Breaking up a little okay. bit, but... Um, <laughs> you still good? Okay. All right, so yeah. yeah, we're basically in the drone industry. So Global Air Media is a commercial drone operator. So we do drone services and industrial inspection, um, construction site mapping, and professional training. And then the Global Air Drone Academy is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we specialize in teaching youth about drones, technology, STEM. And um, our mission is to really just bridge the, the gender and race gap in STEM careers. So we do that by bringing drones to underserved communities, getting them excited about STEM, and uh, yeah, just taking it from there, showing them what all the possibilities are. So since our inception, obviously we're the Global Air Drone Academy. So we knew that we were gonna go global, but we focused on Baltimore initially. And then through networking events like this, we've been able to, to forge partnerships in places like um, Kyrgyzstan, uh, specifically focused in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Nigeria, we just opened up a drone academy um, was in February. So we have a full-fledged drone academy in, in Lagos right now. Um, in Ethiopia. Uh, we've been able to branch out all over the world through the commercial service and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's been great. It's been great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you all for laying just uh, some of the groundwork for this discussion. Um, so I think we really want to hear about just more of your experiences going global um, and how you've managed some of the challenges associated with expanding and entering new markets. Um, so Ellington and Brandon, if I can turn over to you um, just first to see um, if you want to share maybe one or two of the biggest challenges that you've experienced um, going global and operating in that global space, maybe something you wish you knew before starting off or a challenge that you're still experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, when you're going global, the first thing that you really have to do is your research because you need to know what regulatory uh, requirements are going to prohibit you or at least allow you to be able to sell and, mar and market your product. I think that, that was one of the biggest things that we definitely learned a lot about as we've been going through this process because a lot of the regulatory um, requirements fluctuate or change um, based on the country and the market that you're um, hoping to engage with. So you really have to do your research. And that is definitely something that we've done a lot in kind of in uh, in while we were running. Uh, and so we've learned a lot um, in the process. And again, uh, participating in that um, export tech program really helped us to kind of take a step back and see what are some of the things that we need to do and line up before we um, are really ready to make as huge of an impact as we um, know that we can. Yeah, 
Right. And, and to piggyback off of that, one thing that was really interesting and unique about our situation is that we did start off with that global focus, right? We were already working in Malawi and Bangladesh and Peru, and that was the foundation. Even before we were considering commercial sales, we were focusing on research there. And so what we learned very quickly through our export tech program was that just because you have unsolicited interest doesn't mean that that should be the priority for your strategy, right? That you have to really think about where you fit in in the best where you fulfill those market needs before you just kind of dive in. And that seems like a very obvious, you know, thing to say. But for us, we were a startup. We were so excited about people from, you know, I don't know, South Africa calling us in the UAE. And we're like, well, these are all of these opportunities. But unless you have very clear strategic plans for each point of entry in each country, because there are so many nuanced differences, you really have to prioritize how you want to navigate this global market. And it takes support. And one of the things that we really utilized was the gold key service because it allowed us to really vet prior to engagement with a lot of these vendors and, and organizations. And I think that that was truly transformative in terms of our efficiency. Yeah. So do your research and find the resources that you need to help you. That's yes. the best advice we can give. Agreed. Great. Thank you. Um, Austin, do you want to respond or add on to any challenges that you or uh, Global Air Media more generally has experienced? I would echo their sentiments. Uh, research is key, uh, especially when you're talking about a, a nascent industry like drones. Um, you go to different places, the regulations are different, the certifications are different. And as instructors, it's our duty to make sure that we keep up on everything and we're, we're experts on all the, um, the latest developments. So you have to do your research, um, you know, not just on the regulations, but on your partners as well. And also we're, we're customers of the, the gold key service. And that's been tremendously beneficial to us in, in figuring out how to na navigate all the, uh, the potential pitfalls of um, exporting overseas. Great, thank you. Um, and I think, I mean, neither of you are alone at all in those challenges. Um, when we profile small businesses and speak with just startups and entrepreneurs, um, they often cite barriers like the, just some of the administrative burdens that come along with exporting uh, like tariffs and just the different uh, country regulations. Um, and a lot of those barriers are only simplified and have only been simplified uh, by the pandemic. But I think next, I wanna just touch on, touch on um, just use of digital tools and using different technology solutions to help ease some of those challenges and barriers. Um, so I think Ellington and Brandon, if I can go to you first, if you just wanna share um, to what extent have technology-based resources and solutions uh, just helped you ease some of those barriers. Uh, um, they honestly, technology and I mean, we can go very rudimentary, like Google is your best friend. <laughs> you can start there, but also um, the commercial services and uh, Department of Commerce and trade.gov um, yes. have some really great resources. I know we spent a lot of time really looking up our NAICS codes and trying mm -hmm. to figure out which markets and which countries are importing those um, so that way we could prioritize, as I like to mention, you know, it's a, you have to strategize about which markets you're going to enter. And we have, we found that it's really important to tap into as much data as possible. So that way we can um, understand, I mean, even from a domestic side, we look at CDC data and um, insurance data to understand what um, territories or which regions of the U.S. that we should market to. And the same thing applies globally. We looked at trade um, and export data to really understand who, which countries are buying our technology and where our partners could be. Perfect. I think that's going to be a really good segue into our uh, future panels from private sector and government resources. Um, but Austin, um, do you want to share just ways that you have used technology or digital tools to help ease some of the challenges that you've experienced in the global marketplace? Definitely. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to switch our business model uh, pretty quickly this past year, as a lot of companies had. So uh, I definitely echo the sentiment that Google is your friend. Um, using the suite of tools from, from Google has been tremendously beneficial for us, uh, both in administering uh, classes and, and teaching and, and outreach, um, as well as platforms like Facebook for marketing and, and finding students and, and things like that and finding potential clients. So Facebook, Instagram, social media in general has become a, a linchpin of our marketing outreach. So um, yeah, I would say social media, Google, um, platforms like Zoom, like this, uh, have really sustained our business and allowed us to continue to grow and, and survive this pandemic. So uh, the digital tool suite is, is crucial. 
I absolutely agree. Um, and just on that social media piece, Ellington and Brandon, do you want to touch on some of the different ways that you and your business use social media, either to find new customers or maybe like test out new strategies? Just how do you use social media? I think it's multi-layered. And yeah. I'll definitely let Brandon dive in because he's done such a great job of orchestrating, I think, a phenomenal digital marketing campaign for us. But one of the things that I have seen us get the highest return from in terms of support and partnership has definitely been our LinkedIn strategy. We It has allowed us to really partner and, and get in front of hospital you know, CMOs and CFOs that otherwise wouldn't have known that we were out there, but we had a very targeted um, marketing strategy that we were showing up in their feeds. And then we were having kind of like guerrilla approaches to them also just getting in front of them. Yeah, yeah, we really, um, in to Austin's point, using social media to not just promote the work that we were doing, but also to try to find people who are engaged in the space as well. So if I try to find potential car, uh, customers, partners, you know, we are just literally sliding into people's DMs on a regular basis because it, it really helps to uh, kind of bridge some of that um, digital divide that exists in social media because it is a very public and, um, you know, sometimes disconnected space, but you can really create meaningful connections if you uh, reach out and personalize your interactions with people. So we've really That's tried right. to use our marketing team to create engaging content, but at the same time have also been very active in reaching out to people and trying to build um, great relationships as well. And even when you think about things as simple um, as translation, but realizing then how complex it really is. That's something that's really important too, is like, how do you prepare yourself and your marketing team for international engagement? And so something that we're doing now is, you know, translating all of our work into four different languages to ensure that we do have the material necessary to engage with these countries and with these individuals. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then I think just follow up for you two um, quickly, just, so uh, Austin mentioned a little bit of just like changes during COVID and just like the impact of that and increased use of digital tools and social media because of it. Um, can you just give us a brief overview of like one, how your business has been impacted by COVID and then maybe um, a little bit of just how you've used digital tools specifically um, to help kind of navigate that space, especially um, in global markets? Yeah, um, we definitely, as a research uh, company, we were hugely impacted uh, by COVID because all of our clinical partners, I mean, were just inundated. And so a lot of the research that we were doing was ultimately halted because the focus had to be on addressing the needs of the patients who were coming in with COVID. And so asthma, COPD, pneumonia, while we, you know, recognize that the the breadth of those diseases and how many people they're impacting. COVID was a completely different reality for all of our clinical partners. And so we really had to um, take a step back again and really find ways that we could either um, engage and find other partners or look at how we can pilot virtual um, our technology. And again, it's been a, it's been a challenge, but we've really, um, you know, tried to use all of the uh, resources to our disposal to increase our uh, presence in the digital health space. Yeah. And I think what, what's interesting too, is that while we, we ran into research challenges, it positioned us really well in that we've always been a respiratory forward telehealth solution company. So we saw the timeline of people's comfort or the expected timeline of adoption for telehealth really condense quickly overnight. And that added jet fuel to our mission, right? And the interest around what we were doing. So we had to, we were just learning how to walk and we learned, we figured that we had to be in a full-blown sprint in order to be competitive in this space mm -hmm. and having, uh, and we're well positioned to do that, but having then these digital tools that allow us to communicate with other thought leaders in this space, I yeah. think that we would have been traveling so much and it would have taken away from our ability to just focus in on what we needed to do. So I think that we were able to meet more people yep. than we would have otherwise. And um, also we had the time to nurture those relationships because our clinical work was, was halted for a bit. Yeah, yeah, we definitely expanded our relationships, not only with health systems here in the Maryland area, but also in the New York area. Um, we built relationships with Cornell Medical School um, and uh, with hospital systems in Ohio and in Texas and California. So we really um, tried to expand, and again, internationally as well with the University of Antwerp. Uh, we've shipped devices to Nigeria as well as South Africa just in the past few months. Mm -hmm. um, so for, and Peru, 
Fair yep, in the past done. week. Right. So, <laughs> so for us, we really tried to kind of lean into um, using these digital tools to build those relationships and, and make sure that people know that we're still here, even though COVID um, has impacted the research that we're still working and trying to push forward. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Austin, you're the one who uh, brought up the topic, but do you want to add anything else to that, that uh, impact of COVID piece or how you've been using digital tools? Um, increasingly since that, maybe to identify some silver linings or just to kind of um, do that impact piece? Um, I, I would just say that in some ways it's been very beneficial because we've always wanted to transition to a more digital model being service-based. We've always had uh, a desire to be able to streamline our curriculum so that people can receive it all over the world. So COVID kind of forced us into that that uh, platform and that trajectory. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been challenging, but it's definitely been beneficial. And I think, frankly, it's, it's just the way of the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think next I want to just talk a little bit about just general advice or um, best practices that you might have for other either aspiring business owners or startups that are thinking about exporting. Um, but Elliot and Brandon, um, I think I just want to turn to you and ask if you have just general pieces of advice for businesses um, that are either starting exporting or thinking about exporting. Yeah, for the companies that are just starting to think about it, it's so important to surround yourself by the people and resources that have done this before. I think that our experience, and I can't sing the praises of Export Tech enough because I'm telling you that it truly transformed our strategy and our understanding of how we can move and play in this market and in this space because the opportunities are just incredible. I mean, when we think about even the topic of this conversation, it is unlocking that 95% because there is so much. And for small businesses to be able to expand it in a very strategic way that you're hitting this great customer base, but you're also rewarded for you for your export plan, right? There are so many layers of benefits that also come with doing business outside of the US. And I just, I, I highly encourage everyone to do the research up front to find the programs and to lean into them because you can try and do it by yourself. But why would you, when people have done it before and recognize and see all of the perhaps pitfalls that you might run into that could easily be avoided. Yeah, um, I think it, that to Ellen's point, I think it's really important that you you understand what you don't know. Um, mm. And you really, like we started off with doing the research because that was one of the challenges that we had as we were learning things kind of on the fly and learning, oh, we can't actually do this now. Oh, now we have to figure out how to pivot. And I think that um, the more research that you do on the front end um, and the more, I would say grace and um, take it slow. You know, it, it's really important that you, you don't overwhelm yourself and, and try to take off um, too much and more than you yeah. can choose. So really try to take to take your time to understand the full gravity of what you're what you really want to do and then do the research to, so that you make sure that all of the ducks are lined up. Yeah. And I would just say to be incredibly deliberate is key. Just focus on one region, one space, one problem that you're solving for that pain point for that customer, and then use that as evidence to scale, right? But focus very closely on just one and grow from there. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, one follow up on that piece, just is there anything that you wish you had done differently when you first started operating in different countries um, that could help? Um, another business. Yeah, I mean, if we had started export tech sooner, we would. Right. <laughs> you know, for, for us, you know, what was interesting is that we had a lot of MOUs in place. We spent a lot of time on legal fees Building because we were using yeah. attorneys that maybe we didn't need to use. There was a lot of fluff around getting to our bottom line simply because we hadn't done it before. And I think that the, the, the naive notion of where we were was a bit taken advantage of. That's on us. We should have yep. definitely done a deeper dive in research, but I think that we needed the right guidance in those spaces because spending $150,000 on, you know, export uh, legal fees when you don't have, you know, the, the, the ink sign, it's, it's not, I, I don't recommend it. So yeah. yeah, we definitely would have put our, um, we would have reprioritized for sure. Um, and I think that 
participating in the export tech program really helped us to see, oh, we skipped a few steps and yeah. now we have to go back, go back and, and kind of play cleanup. But um, it's definitely been to our benefit for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that is excellent advice. Um, Austin, I'm going to turn to you for the same question. Um, just first, do you have any best practices or advice um, that you would share with other business owners that are interested in exporting and going global? And then is there anything that you wish you had done differently that you think uh, could benefit another business? Yeah, I would definitely second doing your research. That's the most important thing. And not just researching the market, but researching yourself, coming to know what your, your objective is and making sure that you're ready to actually uh, export overseas. So um, as Ellington alluded to earlier, when you get that first opportunity to go overseas, it's, it's really exciting. Um, but you want to make sure that you're prepared for it so that you don't overstretch yourself or, you know, um, exhaust your resources, try to fulfill one client. Uh, one client's needs. The second thing is to really narrow your focus, which they also alluded to. Um, you want to make sure you know exactly what you want to do, again, to, to preserve and conserve resources and, and do it to the best of your ability because it's a big opportunity to expand overseas. You want to make sure that you, you give it your all and, and you, you walk away with, um, you know, knowing that you gave your 100%. So I would say that. And then additionally, um, you know, just don't be afraid to, to take the chance. You know, if we did anything, uh, you know, that we, if there's anything we could do over from the first time, it would probably be to to be more intentional about expanding overseas. Um, we, we just kind of jumped into it. We had some partnerships through the State Department, uh, being our speakers program, being in Kyrgyzstan, uh, places that we didn't even <laughs> really know about to begin with, but we were really excited to work over there. But uh, looking back on it, we should have put a plan together, which we've done now. and. And that's been crucial. Um, and then tapping into resources through commercial service uh, networking, because business is all about networking and, and who you know and, and how you can get in through that door. So make sure that you you do your best to do your networking, your researching before you, you go overseas. That would be my advice. And then if you want to tap in any more resources, feel free to, to email me. Um, and I can definitely tell you all more about personal stories. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that is a good, that's a great place for us to end on. Um, we're about out of time, but Austin Ellington and Brandon, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and for providing just such wonderful insight and sharing your experiences. Um, I think one of you mentioned, I just think I agree that I, one of the biggest benefits um, to small businesses as they want to do anything new, like exporting is hearing from people who have done it. Um, so I think this, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Um, so I'm going to hand the conversation over to my colleague, Jake Colvin, the executive director of the Global Innovation Forum, who will be moderating or moderate uh, the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jamaica. Um, and I, I would just ask uh, Paul, Raquel, and, and Veronica to turn their cameras on as well. Uh, I'm Jake Colvin. I'm executive director of the Global Innovation Forum. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here, um, and thank you to Baltimore Innovation Week organizers, uh, as well as our partners at the Department of Commerce. Um, I'm particularly grateful to Andrew Glass at the Commercial Service in Baltimore for pulling this all together, uh, and to Ellington, Brandon, and, uh, and Austin for sharing their stories uh, just now. Uh, I think this is uh, about the third year that we've engaged in Baltimore Innovation Week, um, missed doing it in person, um, which we did in 2018 and 2019, uh, but hopefully, hopefully we can all do that again uh, maybe next year. Um, Really excited to host the second part of the discussion, which is um, focused on what we're calling uh, three ingredients for going global, which are global marketing, digital sales, uh, and protecting IP. Um, I, I chuckled before when Ellington said that unsolicited, unsolicited interest shouldn't drive your strategy. And, and I think it, uh, it's important to be deliberate and strategic about global engagement, uh, particularly when it comes to regulated industries like electronics and health, um, which are the, the industries that our previous two speakers were in. Um, so we have three experts from uh, the private sector and government to provide advice on these topics. Um, from the private sector, we have um, Paul Disselcohen, who's the Senior Associate for Government Relations at PayPal, uh, and Veronica San Luis, who's the International Growth Project Manager for the Americas um, with Google. Uh, and from the US government, we have Raquel Cohen, who's a Senior IP and Trade Policy Attorney with the um, International Trade Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. Um, I wanted to turn maybe first to Paul and then Veronica from the private sector. Uh, and so, you know, I think stepping back, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about working with startups and small businesses on going global 
um, is because we know that being global and digital um, can position businesses to be more resilient and to grow faster. Um, you heard part of that um, in the uh, some strands of that in the opening conversation. Um, and what we found is that exporter bonus is particularly pronounced for women and minority owned businesses. And so, you know, there are statistics out there in the United States that suggest that women owned firms that export um, benefit from an exporter premium of higher salaries and higher profit. Uh, and that's greater than those um, for uh, exporting businesses owned by men or for women owned businesses that don't export. Um, there's also a correlation between being digital and global. Um, and so companies who use digital tools during the pandemic um, conducted a significantly higher percentage of global business during COVID. Um, and so, you know, turning uh, Paul and Veronica to you first, uh, PayPal and Google sit at this nexus of digital and global. Uh, you know, your companies and, and others um, provide this suite of tools that allow small businesses and startups to go global and, and to be digital. Um, Google already got a shout out from Brandon and Austin in the first panel. Um, and so, uh, you know, just grateful for the two of you for, for being with us today. I wanted to start with a broad question and, and Paul, maybe to go to you first and then Veronica. Uh, you know, what advice do you have to small businesses um, looking to go global? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jake, and uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Um, you know, I, I think that I would just uh, completely echo, you know, what you just said. Um, from our perspective and, and through some of the research that we've conducted, um, you know, we really see that digital commerce is a key to globalization, but um, not only is it, it a key to globalization, it is a key towards democratized globalization. Um, we're really able to see um, small businesses, uh, you know, the, the smallest of businesses really, um, you know, whether they're self-employed, um, or just have one or two employees, as well as female-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, rural businesses, um, access these global marketplaces. Um, and, you know, as, as Jake mentioned, you know, we were able to see that small businesses operating on PayPal, um, you know, really were able to have a level of resilience during the pandemic um, compared to small businesses overall. Uh, we saw PayPal small businesses grow um, at a rate of 25%, their, their revenue growth was 25% during the height of the pandemic. Um, and that's compared to, you know, a 9% uh, decline in revenues for small businesses overall. Um, and these small businesses um, saw 75% of their sales were actually driven by consumers that were outside of their state or outside of the country. Um, so it really just, you know, shows the opportunity that digital commerce provides in expanding to other markets. Um, you know, and, and as Jake mentioned, it, it really allows for that additional growth. So, you know, we found that um, those that exported grew at about 50% um, more year over year than small businesses generally. Um, and we found that rural and urban small businesses traded at exactly the same rate. And uh, female-owned businesses uh, were trading at twice the rate of the uh, overall average of, um, you know, female uh, exporting um, overall. Um, and, you know, I think that it, it just gets back to this trend of, you know, I, I think that we can get into some specific recommendations um, of tools, programs, government policies, later on, but, you know, I really just wanted to start by uh, talking about, you know, what that digital opportunity does for small businesses. Appreciate that, Paul. Um, so Veronica, a sort of similar question to you, um, you know, could you talk broadly about um, what advice you have to small businesses looking to go global from your perch at Google? Sure, absolutely. So I'd say for small businesses looking to expand globally, right? Um, similar to what Brandon Ellington and Austin had shared earlier, take the time to build a sound export plan, right? So when you think about your export plan, this should not only include the markets that you intend to expand to, but also what are the actions necessary to help you set up your operations for success in those markets? And then how are you going to promote your products and services to reach your customers there? Um, now, as Paul was sharing, right, and what we're seeing, you know, with with more and more um, people and consumers around the world going online, especially over the last year, um, you know, what's interesting is that at Google, we've seen that there's been a two times increase in online shopping searches worldwide since last March and cross-border sales 
have grown 21% year over year since um, last June. And we anticipate that this trend is only going to continue, right? Now that consumers on, are online, they're more comfortable researching online, they're more comfortable purchasing online, and they don't care where they're, uh, what countries they're purchasing from essentially, as long as they're getting the high quality goods and services that they're looking for, um, this trend is only going to continue. And I think it'll be helpful for small businesses to keep in mind um, the, the recommendations that we heard from the panel earlier, right? That there are a number of partners and resources that are really available to help you build and execute against your export plan. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, based on, based on a research study by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we're understanding that 92% of American small businesses that export, um, they're heavily using digital tools in their export strategy. So this really speaks to the important role that digital tools and services play in helping small businesses export and reach their international consumers. So when you think about, well, what are these digital tools and services? Um, the, these are the digital productivity tools like Google Workspace that Austin had mentioned earlier. These are e-commerce websites like Amazon and Shopify. These are um, online payment providers like PayPal. And then of course, there's online marketing platforms like Google Ads. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so I, I, think, um, I think both of you sort of touched on uh, kind of placeholders that, that I think I'd like to follow up with, uh, with later on for maybe to dig deeper in terms of specific um, uh, programs and services that, that you provide. But um, for now, uh, maybe wanted to go to Raquel and uh, you know, Raquel, intellectual property protections are, are sort of often new territory for startups. And, you know, I found that talking to some entrepreneurs that they don't put a premium on protecting their, their IP. Uh, I actually had one founder tell me that um, protecting IP wasn't part of the lean startup model um, and not something that they needed to deal with starting out. Um, and so, uh, you know, could you talk about why having an IP strategy is important for small businesses as they approach global markets? Yes, and thank you, Jake, for that question, because that is actually what comes up all the time when we speak to companies. So as uh, the most business leaning office within the US government, I am part of the US Department of Commerce and headquarters. We are a small shop about about five attorneys that we focus on intellectual property and advising companies on how to protect their IP both in the US and also globally before they export. So that is the reoccurring issue that we see. Um, I would say maybe 10% of the companies, US companies that come to speak to us um, are asking us prior to going global or exporting what they can do to secure and protect their IP. And when I speak about IP, we focus on everything from the what I call the IP umbrella, which includes trademarks, patents, copyrights, and even the sexy topic of trade secrets. That's been also a big topic for the US government and advising US companies um, against um, you know, the stealing of trade secrets or your secret sauce from your company. So I would say 10% of those questions are educational and it's pre-export. The majority are unfortunately companies that are already doing business abroad and they've run into issues. Uh, so someone has taken their trademark, uh, we call that also bad faith trademark filing sometimes, um, where they pre-registered for a trademark that's most likely a US company's uh, brand. Um, through exposure on the internet or through initial exposure at a convention or a trade show. Um, and a lot of companies are already facing competitors who are uh, producing counterfeit products or um, counterfeit uh, patent or infringing on their patents. And it's almost too late in some markets. So what we like to call this is sort of like your insurance policy. Uh, in the US government, we advise companies not only register their trademarks and their patents and their copyrights in the US, but to think ahead in your business plan and your expansion of your products in the next five years. And although uh, registering and protecting your intellectual property seems expensive, in the long run, if your pro product is a success or you have spin off products, you, you want to secure your rights because without those rights uh, and those registrations in check, for example, in China, we can't help you enforce your trademarks and your patents and your copyrights. So I think the key message, the takeaway here, if there's one takeaway, is to assure that you, you think and you assess your full IP portfolio and you think of all your brands. And also uh, the other big point I would also like to make is I used to work a lot on China issues and think about your brand from the consumer's perspective in that market. 
So something simple would be like in China, is your US brand known literally as Nike or has a consumer adopted a, a local name, a different name for it in local language and Chinese characters? And if so, you want to think of protecting all those buckets and all those categories to assure that you don't have issues when you're doing business in those markets. Thanks, Raquel. Um, so I wanted to maybe dig a little deeper and, and see if um, I, I could follow up with all three of you now um, to, to ask about um, if you could give one or two specific examples of resources um, that are useful in helping small business small businesses succeed globally or, or build up their digital skills. Um, and for PayPal, well, for all three of you, it can be you know, your, your own resources, that's, that's fine. Um, Paul, maybe start with you and, and then go to Veronica and Raquel. Yeah, absolutely happy to. Um, and I'll just quickly talk about uh, two different things um, that you know PayPal is able to do to help uh, small businesses um, you know transact globally. Um, the first is uh, you know really just starting at the basic level, the the PayPal payments button and and the trust that that uh, that you know has for uh, consumers internationally. Um, you know we found that the um, conversion of checkouts um, when PayPal is offered as, as an option at checkout um, goes up by about 80 percent. Um, so, you know, it's and, and just today, uh, Morning Consult listed PayPal as, as the second um, uh, most trusted brand uh, in financial services. Um, so, you know, I think that that first and foremost, adding that option at checkout, um, you know, will really help to have some of those sales and, and shopping cart uh, uh, conversions, um, you know, when you are dealing with international customers. Um, but second, more specific to actually selling globally, um, PayPal has a global sellers program, um, which you can learn more about um, uh, on our, our website, uh, which amongst other things, uh, translates listings into local currencies, um, making it easier uh, to, you know, tap into those international markets. Um, there's translation and price conversion um, for when local consumers are viewing your website. There is local checkout, um, and it also helps to streamline international shipping. Um, but I think that one of the more interesting things um, is that it also provides analytics and heat maps, um, which uh, I know was talked about a little bit before, um, and uh, can really help small businesses identify you know, which markets um, to target um, and, uh, and what time of the year consumers are buying um, and can really help to uh, navigate something that can seem really overwhelming to start with. Thanks, Paul, that's great. And I think Jamaica just put a link to it in the chat. Um, so uh, Veronica, I, you know, same question to you. Can you I, I dig, dig a little bit deeper um, and talk about a couple of resources that, uh, that can help small businesses or startups go global? Sure. Thanks, Jake. Um, so I may be biased, but right off the bat, I would recommend starting with Google Market Finder. Um, Google Market Finder is our free resource that's available to help businesses expand internationally from the very start at the ideation stage um, down to getting your product to your customer's doorstep. So one of the things that, that I noticed earlier and that we're hearing from companies often is that um, one of the challenges in, in exporting is doing that research initially, right, to help them identify what are the right markets to expand into. And this is something that we were looking to resolve and help with when we built Google Market Finder. And what we had done is we had looked at, okay, well, what are consolidated research sources that we can include into Market Finder to help business understand what are the consumer like in those markets? What are their demographics? Um, how are they searching for and how much demand is there for your industry um, within those markets? We also include some economic factors such as you know, the GDP and the strength of the economy. What does the household income look like to help you understand, okay, well, what does the consumer appetite and buying power look like within those markets? Um, and that's just a few as well as, you know, what does internet access look like within those markets? How are they using the internet in their shopping purchase, et cetera? Um, to really help you to find what your export plan can, 
um, can and should look like. In addition to these factors, we also include um, English language proficiency, which is helpful for those companies whose content is currently in English, their product is in English, so that can help you um, pinpoint and start to define, okay, well, what are the countries that you can expand to and where you can expand to first. Um, outside of this research and, and, and in identifying markets, we also have an operational section within Market Finder. And our goal here was really to provide operational guides, assessments and quizzes, as well as partner recommendations to really help companies get their business and operations ready for success once they do expand abroad. And then finally, what are those best practices and case studies on how to set up your international marketing campaigns, right? So that you can, pr can promote your products and services to those international consumers. Now, outside of Market Finder, um, for businesses that are looking to learn more and grow about digital tools, and if they're interested in trainings, I'd highly recommend that they visit our Grow with Google website. Um, there's a variety of free digital trainings and skills that, that are available and online and virtual workshops that you can sign up for. That's really helpful. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so Raquel, from from the IP perspective, um, you know, what, what sort of resources are out there that I think, you know, this, it gets complicated really quickly. Yes, so I'd like to put a nice plug in for our government website, stopfakes.gov. I'll add it to the chat um, if other colleagues don't add it there um, beforehand. Um, so it's a great website with a lot of resources. My office at the US Department of Commerce has uh, combined a list of interagency resources, including from the US Patent and Trademark Office, or the USPTO, and includes tools on how to assess something very basic, what IP you may or may not have and what to protect. Um, it also includes webinars that seem to be uh, older webinars, but they're still relevant. Some are bad faith trademark registration websites. I'm looking at the website right now. And they're great tools where you can learn practical. I mean, in the US government, and especially in my office, we see so many programs and every uh, region has different ways to address intellectual property infringement. We're trying to streamline the process for SMEs to really know what are the tools that are available to them and how they can help themselves before they go to an attorney to uh, enforce on their IP. So the bad faith trademark registration webinar that we have on our website includes a, a bunch of resources on takedown policies. Um, so one other plug I'd like to make is for the notorious markets list report. So the US government works with all the major online platforms and we try to figure out what, what are the sort of the pain points for SMEs when they can't protect and uh, submit their trademark registrations to prove their registrations to sites to protect their IP on these websites. And if they run into a counterfeiter or a bad actor on one of these websites, what resources do they have so they can, they call it takedown. So you take down the bad actor who is selling a compete, competing product or infringing product on their website. So all of these um, analyses that we do in the US government, the Notorious Markets List Report is also available on stopfakes.gov. And it's sort of a good primer before you go global. And I would say going global could be just going on the internet. You don't have to go to another foreign market. You should take a look at this resource, the Notorious markets list report and the 301 report to sort of get a lay of the land, understanding what are the common pitfalls and issues you may face in each region, whether you have pharmaceutical issues in India and where you should be sort of heavily focused on, on protecting and enforcing your IP uh, before you go to those markets. And then, of course, last point is we also directly work with U.S. companies, and there's a button on stopfakes.gov that would go directly to my office. So if you actually have any issues, uh, either before exporting or while you're doing business in a foreign market, um, we can guide you through the legal process as long as you have uh, your own legal counsel. And in exceptional circumstances, we actually can represent a, U a U.S. company in a foreign market if we see there's bias or the court system isn't working to your favor and things are lagging in that market or there's uh, a bad actor that has some government connection, the US government can step in and assert your rights on your behalf. So um, I'm glad to, to work with you uh, going forward if you see the little button on stopfakes.gov. Thanks, Raquel. Um, so I wanted to ask, Jamaica had asked the founders earlier um, about challenges that they faced um, as they went global. So I wanted to ask you the same, the, the three of you, the same question. Um, you know, could you identify um, from where you sit and, and from how you work with uh, startups and small businesses, 
what is the biggest challenge or two challenges that you see small businesses and startup space as they go global? Um, and you know, if you have any uh, advice for overcoming those challenges. Uh, Veronica, could we start with you this time? Sure, happy to. Well, first off, I think it's important for small businesses to remember that it's not a race and that you don't need to rush your global expansion. Small businesses especially need to prioritize your resources and your assets when planning for growth. So um, take the time to review your assets and test markets before making that big global plunge. Um, so for instance, one, one way that we often see um, businesses start, right, is by, um, again, looking at their assets. So if they find that the majority of their, um, their, their website and their product is in English, consider starting your expansion into English speaking markets. This will, this will require less of an undertaking when you first expand abroad. Um, so Canada, as you can imagine, that's a very popular market for US businesses. And that makes sense, right? 90% of Canadians, they live within 100 miles of our US border. Um, other English speaking markets to consider, of course, are the UK, Ireland, Australia, and even New Zealand. Um, and as you're reviewing your assets, think about, okay, well, what, what languages outside of English are, is your content already in, right? So for instance, if you have French content, you know, in addition to um, reaching consumers in France, think about how you can also leverage this content to reach consumers in, in other countries, such as um, Cana um, French Canadian speakers, right? Um, in addition, uh, thinking back to what the panelists earlier this morning had shared, nobody does it alone. There are hundreds of other companies that have taken the steps that you're going to begin taking. Um, they've made mistakes, they've learned from them, and you can take this opportunity to learn from and avoid these common pitfalls. So rather than trying to become an export expert on your own, look for partners that can really help you ease this export journey. Um, in, in Market Finder, I had mentioned earlier that we have some recommendations on partners that you can consider working with. Um, this is offered both in regards to logistics providers as well as payment processors. Most recently, we added a section for digital marketing agencies who are certified in helping businesses expand internationally. Um, these, these agencies, they have access to tools, trainings, and resources to help companies not only build their expert plan, but to also identify what are those markets that you can expand into. Thanks, Veronica. I, you know, one of the one of the things I miss about doing these in person is that um, you can have these um, kind of sidebar conversations and these opportunities where um, you know, you get the audience together with um, speakers who have been there and done that before. And you know, all of a sudden you start saying, "Well, look, I did it this way, and I did it this way, and you should go talk to that person." And it's a lot harder to do um, over over the internet. Um, and so, you know, look forward to to those days where we get back together in person. Um, Paul, uh, same question to you. Uh, you know, can you identify a challenge or two? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just start right there because that was one of the things that I was going to mention. Um, you know, I think that there are tremendous resource groups out there of fellow small businesses. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have really seen is being able to foster an environment um, where, you know, those uh, small businesses can come together. You know, there are plenty of groups on, on you know, Facebook and, and other social media platforms um, where, you know, there are recommendations and, uh, a lot of it is trial and error, and and there are folks that have you know done it before and and are willing to provide that advice. So that's one key piece. Um, you know, there's some other barriers I think that um, can be addressed. Um, you know, uh, with help from from governments, um, um, but you know, specific to barriers that you know some private sector companies can help out with. Um, one of the biggest barriers that we've seen and we've heard. Um, through, you know, a lot of the surveys that we've conducted is um, access to capital and having that additional financing and cash on hand um, to expand into other markets. Um, uh, PayPal has, um, uh, one of the things that, that folks sometimes don't realize is PayPal has um, done uh, small business lending for years now. Um, and through our PayPal Working Capital Program and PayPal Business Loans, um, we have helped small businesses go global with some of that additional capital that they're able to get um, using different methods of, um, of data um, to assess creditworthiness outside of um, FICO scores and, and traditional things like that. Um, and, um, you know, I think that that is, that is one key area um, that can really help a small business get that confident and get those resources 
um, to uh, to expand. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, you know, as we talk with small businesses, uh, access to, to capital and financing is, is absolutely one of the biggest challenges. Um, Raquel, I know you already put some challenges on the table. Um, are there other? Is there another challenge that you'd like to highlight or one you'd like to expand upon? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jake. Um, I would say uh, American companies need to think not with their American legal cap when they go abroad, but really think about the quirks and the differences and the nuances of every market they're going to go into. So, for example, in China, uh, you think you may have a copyright registration uh, lined up with the government, but you may be missing a seal. And the seal may be really important, a document that you didn't provide, and you may offend a local official. So I think the, the key there would be, and this goes hand in hand with my second point, which is about joint ventures, to have sort of a local person to give you advice on communication, on culture, on expectations, and you really have to immerse yourself in their culture when you're about to uh, venture out into a deal, into doing business, into creating a joint venture. And at the same token, my other point would be, be very wary of who you enter into a joint venture agreement with. Um, and the reason I say that is we've seen a lot of companies who say, oh, we, we ran into another individual who wants to be our representative in this country. They're going to go ahead and file our trademark for us. They're so helpful and they're so, you know, they're so out there helping us. And then we find out for the U.S. company, this trademark was registered under this foreign representative's name. So you want to sort of tread very carefully when you go abroad, um, you know, make good establish good relationships, but at the same time, be very wary and understand uh, you're in a different market with different rules. It's not the United States. The court systems are different. Um, and to sort of put all, get all your ducks in a row um, and to be mindful every step you take in the business uh, journey you're taking in each market. That's a really good point. Um, thanks, Raquel. And so I, I think we're, we're about out of time for, um, for this discussion. I wanted to thank Veronica, Raquel, and Paul for, um, for joining us for this. Um, really appreciate your insights. Uh, and now I get to turn it over to Trisha Van Orden, who's the Deputy Director for the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee of the International Trade Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, Trisha, um, over to you. Thank you. Jake, thank you so much. I'm so excited about our, um, our final panel as part of this program. So I'm going to ask Rebecca, Andrew, and Jessica to turn on their cameras and join me. Um, and of course, I want to thank Jake and Jamaica um, for the Global Innovation Forum's continued partnership with the International Trade Administration. It's always a wonderful experience to work together on programs like this. Um, and I do also want to note that it is World Trade Week. Uh, I don't know if that had been mentioned earlier in the program, but what a, what a perfect time to be having this conversation. I'm Trisha Van Orden. I serve as the Deputy Director of the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee, which is based at Commerce Headquarters in Washington, DC. And I really want to underscore the word coordinating in my title. The role of our office is to align all of the federal government resources that are available for startups and small businesses to go global. And there's also tons of resources um, from government and institutional partners at the state and local level as well. And so our overall goal is to really strengthen the export ecosystem to best support US companies. And so I'm so excited uh, to be joined on this panel um, by Maryland's export dream team. There's no other way to describe them. Um, and they all work together to help Maryland businesses successfully plan to go global and navigate international businesses. So we've got um, Rebecca Bellinger, who's the executive director for the Center for Global Business at the University of Maryland Smith School of Business. Andrew Glass, my colleague at the Department of Commerce, who's a commercial officer based at the US Commercial Service Office in Baltimore. And Jessica Reynolds, who's the senior director of the Office of International Investment and Trade for the Maryland Department of Commerce. So can I ask each of you to please give a, a brief overview of your organization and the export assistances that you provide to companies in Maryland. I'm gonna start with Jessica and then um, turn to Rebecca and then Andrew. Sure. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, so my office is the Office of International Investment and Trade in the Maryland Department of Commerce. Our office is the office in Maryland state government that assists Maryland companies looking to export. Uh, we are also responsible for attracting foreign direct investment to the state and marketing the state internationally. Uh, we do offer a range of uh, services for our exporters, um, some of which we'll get into a little more detail later, but we do have some funding available for exporters. We also have a network of uh, 18 foreign offices and uh, our team can offer, you know, one-on-one -on -one guidance uh, through a variety of issues. So I'll, uh, I'll keep it short uh, so we can get into more details uh, later, but uh, yeah, that's the quick, that's the quick overview. Thanks. 
Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And Trisha, thank you for that great introduction. I feel like we need matching sneakers now, Dream Team. Um, so as Trisha mentioned, I am the executive director of the Center for Global Business at Maryland Smith at the University of Maryland College Park. And we are a center of excellence at the school and the hub of global partnerships and, and global learning. We're funded in part by a Title VI SIB grant administered by the US Department of Education. And this is what propels our services outside of campus. We serve a wide variety of constituents, students, faculty, alumni, and you, the business community. And probably the most of most interest to, to you, this, this specific audience, would be some of our thought leadership activities that explore issues related to the global economy, trends in, in you know, hot markets abroad, that sort of thing, um, as well as the student training that we do to prepare our students to be your next hires, um, as well as our direct service and export education programs designed to both educate and assist you with market entry, market research, um, feasibility studies, and, and more. And I hope that we have a chance to talk more about these specific programs later in the panel. All right. Hello, everyone, again. Um, so I am Andrew Glass, and I'm representing the U.S. Commercial Service in Baltimore, specifically our U.S. Export Assistance Center in Baltimore. Um, and the U.S. Commercial Service is part of the International Trade Administration within the Department of Commerce. And we are a network of domestic trade specialists at U.S. Export Assistance Centers serving every state in the U.S. Uh, we are paired with a uh, foreign network. Uh, foreign service officers and locally employed commercial specialists at embassies and consulates in 95% of US export markets around the world. So if you think about us, our, uh, our domestic network is really um, what you can consider your account executives, your folks who are walking with you through every stage of your export journey. And then we are connecting you with our, with our colleagues uh, abroad to, to execute those specific services. And we are here to help you increase your international sales and compete on a level playing field. And we do this by supporting you with market intelligence, with due diligence on potential partners, with identifying distributors and buyers abroad, and promoting your product and service in your target markets. And we work very closely with our, our export promotion dream team in Maryland, uh, with, with the University of Maryland, um, uh, Smith School Center for Global Business, as well as with Jessica's team with the Maryland Department of Commerce. So really happy to be on this panel with both of them. All right, thank you all three so much. Um, so as we've heard on our, our previous panels, there are just tons of opportunities for companies of all sizes in all sectors, international markets. Ellington, Brandon, and Austin talked about how going global has been really transformational for their businesses. And you just heard from, from Paul and Veronica about some of the stats on the increase in cross-border sales over the past year. Um, and it's the name of this program, 95% of all consumers are outside the United States. But it does take commitment and it can take some dedicated resources to build a successful global business. What are the, some of the challenges that you've seen businesses run into when they're starting to make international sales? And what's your advice to those companies that are just starting out? I can jump in um, if that's OK. Um, so I, I would say that a lot of times I find that the, the small companies that we work with don't even know where to start or think that exporting or global expansion is too daunting to even consider at, at an early stage or even a, you know, the, the next, next stage in growth. So a lot of times they don't even follow through in opportunities that are presented to them. And then Trisha, they miss out on that 95%. So I promise to everyone on this webinar that going global isn't as hard as you might think. And the best thing to do, I think, is to to try to get beyond that initial fear, perhaps by networking and learning. Of course, the educator on, on the panel would say that. And what you're doing right now is a fantastic example of this. Attend events like this one. Be inspired by what, what your peers in industry are doing. Enroll in programs like Export Tech, which, which I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about. Um, connect with industry mentors through organizations like the District Export Council. And, and I'm a member of that, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that if we have a chance. I would also say get on mailing lists, join um, the Maryland International Business LinkedIn group, and that's actually the title of it, Maryland International Business, so that you're always in the know and connected to the resources that you might overlook or, or miss otherwise. And then I'll turn it over to, um, to Andrew or Jessica. Sure, I can jump in. Um, 
Yeah, so the other thing that I would say, which actually, um, you know, the, the companies uh, that have already spoken have, have touched on this a bit, but, you know, make sure you, you plan ahead, do your research, make sure that you are going to actually dedicate the staff and resources to, to follow through. Um, you know, as Rebecca was saying, you know, actually following all the way through is, is important. Uh, so you do want to think about that in advance. Um, and the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, also think about your website. Uh, in advance also. So, you know, we work with a lot of companies uh, that, you know, maybe the opportunities are coming up to them, they hadn't thought about it in advance, but then they're starting to get inquiries and their website really is not prepared for, uh, for an international audience. So I would say if you're considering exporting, look at that as uh, something that you do early on to be prepared for that international audience. I'll just uh, jump in and, and just add two things from, from my perspective. And this is actually um, more from my perspective as someone who did international business development in a prior role in a past life. Um, I see it as well with, with, with our clients in Maryland, but the first would be, and I think you've heard this from the panelists, you know, trying to go it alone. Um, when you can put your government to work for you, whether that be at the federal, state, or local levels. I think you've heard a lot about the resources that, that, that we can offer you um, and really accompany you on your export journey. So certainly take advantage of that because it's really, really daunting and really hard to do it alone. I know I personally really struggled through that in, in previous roles before I joined the federal government. Um, so take advantage of the fact that we can help you with due diligence to vet incoming inquiries from, from potential foreign partners, connect you with known and vetted distributors and buyers abroad, and help you make data-driven decisions about which markets to enter. So certainly take advantage of that. And the, the second um, major, major challenge that I see folks confronting is not doing homework upfront about which markets are going to be best for their product or service. So really going for a, for a market based on a hunch, or you, you have a friend there or a family member there who says it's going to be a great opportunity. You certainly want to make sure that you are making data-driven decisions because there's opportunity cost involved in pursuing each new foreign market. Um, you, you want to make sure that you're grabbing the low-hanging fruit where your product and services are going to be the, the most successful. And I think everyone on this panel um, is, is you know, well equipped to help you identify that low hanging fruit and those target markets that you should be going to first. Thank you all three so much for those, those insights. Um, and so I wanna kind of delve a little deeper into some of the very like specific programs that are available. And we all know growing a business takes investment in your business. And so can you talk a little bit about what sort of financial programs or grants are available to minimize the cost of growing a business through international expansion? And Jessica, I'm gonna to turn to you first for this one. Okay, great. Uh, well, we do have a great grant program available to exporters, so I'm happy to start that off. So we have a program in Maryland called the Export MD program, which is a reimbursable grant for up to $5,000 uh, to uh, small businesses looking to pursue a marketing an export marketing initiative. So this program um, is available to it's to small companies only uh, because we do receive funding for this program from the SBA through the State Trade and Export Promotion Program. Um, but uh, we we actually it's such a um, in demand program that there's state funding in it as well. So we actually use resources from both to, to try and meet the needs of as many companies as possible. Um, so a lot of companies have in the past used this program for uh, you know, traveling uh, to attend trade shows or mission or business development trip. Uh, but there's actually a lot of other eligible activities under this grant as well. Well, including your, um, you know, digital advertising and marketing that can include your website, uh, regulatory compliance, uh, shipping sample products. So there's a range of things that are that are covered under the grant, uh, all focused around export marketing. So certainly encourage uh, small companies to consider looking into this program. We're always looking for new companies to participate. Um, that's actually one of the things that. Uh, we, we really try and make a focus on to, to reach out to new companies to participate in this program, uh, which has been going on for over 10 years at this point. Um, the other uh, finance item I'll mention is that uh, also part of our STEP 
uh, grant from the SBA. Uh, we do separately from the Export MD reimburse some of the services through the US Department of Commerce. So the Baltimore USIAC, if you're participating in some of their activities uh, that I'm sure Andrew will mention, and there are fees associated with that, we can reimburse uh, two thirds of those costs as well. So, um, and that doesn't have to come out of uh, your Export MD funding. So you can pursue both of those avenues. Yeah, and just to, just to follow up on that, um, really the number one uh, place where, where I would send clients for, for funding would be the state of Maryland. Uh, we work very closely with Jessica and her team to make sure that our companies who are taking advantage of those services um, do get their two thirds reimbursement from the state of Maryland, as well encourage everyone to apply for those export MD grants. I can't say enough about those opportunities. Uh, I, I have many clients pursuing them my, myself and they're really fantastic. Um, just to add, add on to that, there's also the Export Import Bank of the U.S., um, which offers export credit insurance, which protects U.S. exporters against non-payment by foreign buyers and enables you to offer competitive credit terms to your buyers. Um, they also offer the Working Capital Guarantee Program, which is a guarantee uh, that they offer commercial lenders um, that, that make you a loan to purchase or manufacture goods or services for export. There's also the Small Business Administration, which partners with lenders to guarantee loans for exporting. Uh, for example, there are an example of one of their loans is the Export Express Loan, which you can be approved in as little as 36 hours for up to $500,000. Um, and, and these are all resources too, uh, you know, that I'd just like to emphasize that we can connect you to these resources. There's no need to remember every single detail about them. This is the benefit of working um, with the U.S. Commercial Service, with the state of Maryland, um, and with Marilyn Smith, as we can bring you into this ecosystem and make sure that you are paired up with the right resource. And I'll also just mention finally is there are many free webinars to take advantage of through the commercial service, as well as low cost or free services, such as our website globalization service, which is very low cost, which takes a look at your website from the perspective of a foreign buyer and make sure that it's up to par with best practices, as well as uh, we offer virtual connection events for you to uh, make a one-on-one -on -one connection with vetted buyers in your target market. And these are also low cost services uh, that can be reimbursed from the state of Maryland. So I encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of them. Rebecca, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Um, all right. Andrew started to preview my next question, which is, can you highlight useful tools and strategies to help companies reach global customers online and optimize their digital operations? So um, Andrew, maybe I'll start with you. You can talk about a few of those, those virtual services and, and online services, and, and we'll chat about the digital space for a few moments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as we all heard from, from Paul earlier, uh, having a digital strategy is incredibly important. We saw how important it's been during the pandemic, but it's really, um, you know, it, it signals kind of a, a paradigm shift in the future. So much of our e-commerce is going to be conducted over digital channels. So we want to make sure um, that you're taking advantage of all the opportunities to get your website, to get your payment mechanisms up to par. And here at the, at the U.S. Commercial Service, we have an e-commerce innovation lab that um, offers best practices in, in digital strategy. We offer a digital strategy assessment, digital readiness assessment, where we take a look at your practices and recommend improvements. We also offer the website globalization service that I mentioned earlier. And this is where we uh, take a look at your website from the perspective of a foreign buyer and make sure that it's that's really compliant with best practices. And we could even look at some of your target markets and get some of our colleagues from those markets to weigh in on how they perceive the content on your website whether that's the language you use, the images you use, um, the search engine optimization of your website, making sure that you're listed on all of uh, the most popular search engines in your target uh, countries. We take a look at your website and make sure that you're equipped with all this information and with this powerful analysis. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great way that we can really get, get everyone up to speed uh, with their digital strategy practices. jump in and I'll try to be brief, although I could talk about this forever. So um, here's where I, I admit to everyone that the, the dream team here also goes by another name, which is the MAPIT Alliance. So the Maryland Partners in International Trade is the District Expert Council, the USIAC, Jessica's team at Commerce and the Center for Global Business. And we collectively have 
gotten together to facilitate greater access to all of the resources that everyone's been talking about. And as an offshoot of that mission, this past year, we have been putting out a, a specific um, series of, of webinars that are addressing this exact issue of how, how do exporters take advantage of the virtual or the e-commerce space? So we have a series of nine distinct topics um, that that are still available for viewing. And some of these topics include website globalization, preparing for virtual trade shows, which is a really important one, conducting online research and, and more. And as I said, all of those webinars are still available in recording version, and we can make sure that those are, are included in the link. A couple of other things that I'll mention, um, we have a global consulting program that we run at the Center for Global Business in collaboration with Jessica's team. Um, and what we do here is we match Maryland businesses who have a need, whether it be website globalization, SEO, or market research and selection, market entry strategy, whatever it is, you can actually work with a group of highly talented students to address your specific need. They're very highly customized um, projects that the students will work on with you. Um, and then the final thing that I'll mention is um, a global marketing virtual internship program that we run every summer, which is again, working with students where you take on these students as interns and they do all of that with you and, and for you. Again, e-commerce, website globalization, <clears throat> excuse me, social media marketing and a myriad of, of other, um, other opportunities. And I'll throw some of those links in, in the chat as well. And then at Commerce, uh, we've had to do pivoting as well. Um, so one thing I'll mention is that in a normal year, we would have a schedule of trade shows and missions uh, that we're doing uh, through you know different parts of the world, and we take delegations of companies with us, uh, where you know we we make that very accessible for small companies to participate. I should note this is also funded through our step grant. Um, and so, you know, we're taking between six and 10 companies to seven or eight shows a year. Of course, in the past year, there was not travel. So we have converted uh, our schedule to a range of virtual shows and missions. Uh, we've completed three uh, so far this year. Uh, one is ongoing right now, and we have three more coming up before the end of the summer. So, um, you know, if uh, if anyone is interested in those, certainly let us know. The ones coming up are focused on cybersecurity in the UK, uh, space and satellite technology in Australia, and we're looking at life sciences in South Korea. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention, I touched on this briefly in my introduction, but we have a network of 18 foreign offices that can assist you. So that service is really very flexible in that, you know, we have representatives, they can provide up to 20 hours of free assistance to Maryland companies per year. And, uh, you know, we can develop that scope of work with you. So if part of what you need to do is looking at how to be more virtual or looking at your, you know, social media presence in a country or something like that, that may be something we can look at. And we're always happy to, you know, talk with our representatives and see how we can assist you. We can also, you know, virtually help set up, um, you know, meetings or, or identify partners or do just some general research for you through those offices as well. Um, and one other thing I will note is that the other services mentioned by um, my uh, colleagues here on the panel are also eligible for our export MD funding or, or um, through the direct USIAC reimbursement funding. Thank you all so much for kind of giving a really thorough rundown of all the different services that are available in the virtual environment. Um, now I'd like to pick up on a, a theme, Rebecca, that you mentioned, um, and I'm glad you, you highlighted Map It, um, but you know, the district export councils are also referenced. Um, I think for, especially from the startup and the entrepreneur perspective, like it's, it's really um, valuable to be plugged into a broader alliance, a broader network to help build your business. And so I'm wondering if you can provide a little more information or details about how entrepreneurs or startups can really leverage your organization and your alliance to build their professional networks and what kind of activities they can participate in. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first here. I think one uh, program that um, Brandon and Ellington highlighted was export tech. Uh, and I put it, I put some information in the chat about it earlier. It really is the premier program to accelerate international sales for early stage businesses in Maryland. Uh, 
Um, we just did a virtual export tech program this year, which was the, the first of its kind that concluded um, in, in February. We already have participants from that program that are already seeing sales that they directly attribute to their participation in export tech. And that is uh, a program that walks you through the A to Z of exporting, kind of systematically prepares you to develop your export plan, focuses you on your target markets, identifies areas of weakness where, where we can help you improve. Um, so I really do encourage folks to, to take advantage of upcoming export tech programs. We'll probably be doing one either later this year or, or early next year. Um, and again, that's that's run in partnership uh, with the state of Maryland, with Maryland Smith, um, and and with other other federal colleagues and other state colleagues. Um, so it's a fantastic program for early stage companies. Another is the District Export Council, as my colleagues mentioned, which is a group of experienced exporters. Uh, Jessica and Rebecca are, are both on our District Export Council, as well as private sector leaders of experienced export companies. These are folks who really do enjoy mentoring uh, early stage companies and connecting early stage companies with, um, with folks who they know in their network who can assist them at various stages of their export journey. And then finally, I suggest joining that uh, Maryland International Business LinkedIn group, and I will put that in the chat. That's where we share uh, opportunities and resources for our Maryland International Business community. It's a great way to stay engaged and to, uh, to start forming your network. Um, thank you, Andrew. I, I would add to that um, an enthusiastic come to our events. Um, the center specifically is putting on a fantastic event um, in, in about two weeks. Um, and yes, co-sponsored by Jessica's team and, and Andrew's team. And it's a great next thing that you would do after, after today's event. It's called the Maryland Business Adapts Roundtable. It's taking place on June 3rd, and it celebrates the resilience of Maryland's exporters while providing a convening space, I, I would call it, for company executives to share their insights on topics like how they minimize risk to their global operations or whether the impact of, of sudden operational changes. We're recognizing five small Maryland companies, just like you, um, and US Senator Ben Cardin, Maryland Secretary of Commerce Kelly Schulz, and McCormick's Anthony Roche, who is the VP of Human Relations, are also coming out to speak. It promises to be a fantastic event focused on global business resilience. And you can expect to walk away with, with best practices and expanded network, which we've all mentioned is really important, and some ideas on how you can innovate in your workplace to be successful going global. And we'll, we'll share the link in, in the chat. And I'm happy to, to add some more to this as well. Um, I think we've talked quite a bit about the Alliance and certainly, you know, through through any of us, uh, you know, I think we can help you with networking. Um, one item that I did not mention uh, previously is that the state of Maryland also uh, maintains a number of international partnerships and relationships. Um, you know, we have several memorandums of understanding in place with different uh, regions around the world, sometimes uh, around specific industries. Uh, and I mean, I think we're up to I don't know, probably 16 or 18 of these right now. Um, so that's another uh, resource for, for Maryland companies. You know, if you're looking to export into a certain region, you know, besides our foreign offices, and of course the US Department of Commerce and Maryland Smith uh, and their services, we also can go directly um, to our colleagues, um, you know, generally government representatives in other countries where we maintain those relationships as well. Um, and then uh, we have a mailing list also, so happy to have, uh, you know, you all uh, follow that as well, which can be found on our website. Uh, that is where we also announce our upcoming trade shows, missions, and other events. We often will have partner events listed as well, whether those are here in Maryland or perhaps our international partners so sometimes have events that, that we post as there also. Uh, and then I would also recommend uh, that companies look into, if you're really looking to get into exporting and international business, look at some of the other organizations here in Maryland that may be able to assist you. We have um, a global chamber chapter um, here in uh, the Maryland and 
DC area. Uh, we also have the World Trade Center Institute, and these are organizations that may also help you with your networking. And that's uh, that's something that they, they put on a lot of events that um, you know focus on on that type of activity and helping you connect with other international businesses in the area. Thank you all three so much for giving that like very um, comprehensive overview of all of the organizations and resources that are available to Maryland businesses. Um, and I see that Andrew dropped the LinkedIn um, link into the chat. So that's obviously a great way for people to stay on top of everything that's happening in the Maryland export ecosystem. Um, before we wrap up our panel, could you just let the audience know like, like how to get in touch with you all or your organization? And then I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if a company has never exported before and they're looking to make that first contact, where should they turn first? Pretty much any of us, <laughs> we all connect to the others, which is, uh, you know, uh, I think I've said that in, in most of my presentations in the past few years. Uh, you know, I, I would say you can really start with any one of us. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I'm happy to, you know, take inquiries. I, I know my colleagues here on the panel are as well. Um, we'll make sure that we, you know, if you heard about a program and it wasn't one of ours, we'll make sure to connect you to our colleague who is running that. So um, I don't know if, if anyone else has something to add to that, but I think really you can start with any of the organizations. So we all work pretty closely together in Maryland. I, I echo that, Jessica, 150%. And that, that I think is really the, the beauty of what we've set up in Maryland is that we all know each other, we all work together, we all are supporting everyone's, um, everyone's programs. So there is no wrong first, um, first inquiry or first, first connection. Absolutely. I mean, my, my colleague said it, no wrong door in Maryland. Um, I just dropped into the chat the, um, the contact us page for the US Commercial Service in Baltimore. You'll see that our, our trade specialists in our office are broken down by industry. Uh, so that means we go deep and, and really seek to understand your industry and, and markets that are going to be good for, for your company. And, and of course, um, we, we work very closely with Rebecca very closely with Jessica, making sure you're connected to the right resources, making sure that you're maximizing your resources as well when it comes to you know, what, what you're paying. We wanna make sure that, um, that you're taking advantage of the 20 free hours uh, of, of the FlexX program offered by the state of Maryland. We wanna make sure that you're taking advantage of the opportunities, webinars, and events that, that Rebecca's team offers. So um, happy to, to plug you in with, with any of that. All right, so basically Dream Team is gonna guarantee you a slam dunk. And I just wanna thank you guys all so much for your time. We went a couple of minutes over for this panel. So Andrea, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to uh, take us home. All right, thank you so much, Trisha. And thank you so much, Jessica and Rebecca. Um, we have come to the, the end of our session today, of our time together today. Uh, I just wanna thank all of our panelists for sharing their time and insight with us. Austin, Ellington, and Brandon, Raquel, Paul, and Veronica, and Rebecca and Jessica, you truly brought this session to life today and shared um, very important information for, for all of our attendees. I know I learned a lot as a, as a panelist as well. And of course, thank you once more to our moderators, to Jamaica, Jake, and Trisha. Thank you so much for your time and, and for your insight. I uh, just want to remind everyone that you will be, you will be receiving an email with all of these wrap up resources and contact information in the next few days. So if you didn't jot everything down, uh, don't worry about that at all. I know there's a lot of information that we covered today and a lot of ground that we covered. So I'd just like to leave you with, uh, with one final thought. Remember, please don't make the mistake that I did as an exporter in thinking that you're in the saloon. You're not, we are here to help you. We look forward to working with you and to really accompanying you on your export journey as you grow your business in international markets. So thank you once again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy the, 